Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dennis Doda. And I'm Tracy McRae. You know, recently, the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine hosted its annual conference, and one of the hot topics was pharmacogenomics. It's the ability to tailor medications based on genetic makeup to individualized patients. And, uh, you know, when it comes to pain medications, pharmacogenomics testing is also a new frontier uh, aimed at finding the best therapies that relieve pain with hopefully fewer side effects. With the current opioid crisis, understanding how a person's genes interact with medication holds promise of identifying which patients would benefit from an appropriate use of opioids and which may be at risk of addiction. Here to discuss are Dr. Timothy Curry and Dr. Helena Gazelka. Dr. Curry is the director of the education program at the Center for Individualized Medicine, and Dr. Gazelka is an assistant professor of anesthesiology and perioperative medicine at Mayo Clinic. Welcome both of you to the program. Thank you. Thank you. So do people, I know people metabolize pain differently, but does everybody, just a fraction of the population, what do we know about it? We don't know a lot about <laughs> it yet. There are certain um, genes that we know are associated with opioid metabolism and certainly affect opioid metabolism. And so sometimes we can select uh, appropriate medications for patients. A lot of times it's actually, that's not very practical. And so it's often trial and error, whether seeing whether a medication works for a patient or not. A simple example is codeine. About 15 to 20% of the population cannot metabolize codeine Whoa. into morphine, which is required for the medication to become active. So you could have somebody who continues to be in pain just because for whatever reason the drug doesn't get switched on in their body. That's exactly right. Wow. How much is uh, known about the uh, currently known about the role of genetics and its effect on individual patients? Whichever one of you. Well, we know a lot about the genes that people have that relate to these medications um, just because of the work that's been done. How they get, that gets used, how that information gets used is the, t is the challenge. Um, there's been a lot of work going on at Mayo Clinic. We've been talking about it a lot this week at the conference. And that is to how do you take that information, get it in front of the providers who are writing the prescriptions, get it in front of the pharmacists that are then helping guide that medication use, uh, and then making being able to make the decisions on that information. So if you had the information about a specific drug and you knew that it was going to, you wanted to find out if it was going to work better or not work at all for a patient, you'd want to have access to that information. You also want to know how to use that information if you could do it, which is what the education program is working on. Now you're an anesthesiologist, and I know a little bit before the program you mentioned to me that oftentimes the person's first exposure to a pain medication that contains opioids might be in surgery and, and you feel a sense of responsibility to know more and hope pharmacogenomics can help you do that. Yeah, and that's something I think we're focusing on right now. And Dr. Gazelle can talk a lot about the efforts that are being done right now uh, at Mayo Clinic to make sure that that first exposure is one that doesn't end up causing a problem. Dr. Gazelle, tell us more. Well, that's true. We know that um, if, when we speak about addiction, which we mentioned at the beginning of the program here, that the first exposure to opioids is often a surgical uh, event or an acute event where someone has an injury or they come in and have a surgery, maybe their wisdom teeth removed, maybe an orthopedic procedure, um, and then they are placed on pain medications for a time afterward. And we know that the length of time that they're on those medications, how much they receive, and um, several other factors weigh into how, how that patient's risk of becoming addicted afterward. And so it matters what we treat them with for pain afterward. Do you think at some point down the road, knowing our, our own set of genes that affect the medications we're giving will become standard testing that will have, you know, at, at least that relevant part of the genome worked up for individuals? I mean, I think so. It's, it's, Part of the barriers were cost, and the costs are really coming down now. The second barrier will be how do you use that information? We've talked about that, both the understanding of how to use the information, but also its use in the actual practice of medicine, because we're going to be, have to figure out how to get it to a provider at the time they're actually writing the prescription. Um, and that takes the expertise of the electronic health record and using clinical decision support. Uh, and then once all that comes into place, then I think it'll be a, an easier way to, uh, to choose to use that information in everyone. We were talking before we got going, I think even before you guys got here, about people having a high pain threshold or a low pain threshold. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a different genetics issue. It doesn't have to do with the medication, but how a person even perceives pain to begin with. That's very true, and that is so individual. We really don't know what 
what all factors weigh into that. It's probably partly environmental. Probably it's genetic in some ways. We, we know that families, there tend to be families that have more pain syndromes in them. Chronic pain tends to uh, be perpetuated in families. But how much of that is environmental and how much of it is genetic, I think we just don't know right now. But we know that there's certainly a genetic component because, for example, there are diseases where people can't feel pain at all. And that's actually mm -hmm. dangerous because then you put your hand on a hot stove and you don't know to take it off. And that causes problems, too. So there's something there. The challenge now is going to be bringing the right people together, um, both the clinicians that are dealing with the problems as well as the researchers who are trying to figure this out. Now, in your role as a researcher, Dr. Curry, I know you've also looked at ways to avoid um, the application of opioids at all through other pain management techniques. Uh, and I know you had talked about the escalation of pain and, and short-circuiting that before the pain becomes too intense, or even using different kinds of devices in pain management during surgery. Could you just briefly address that? Sure. So in, in my realm in anesthesiology, it's is in the surgical realm, and particularly in orthopedics, which is just a painful type of surgery to have. And by doing things like using non-opioid pain medications, um, by using nerve blocks where we can try to prevent that pain from really ever escalating to the point, and maybe even bridging them all the way to the point where they won't need opioids at all, um, we think that could be helpful. On the other hand, as an anesthesiologist who's also a specialist in pain medicine, uh, Dr. Kazelka works on that on the chronic level. Yes, yeah, so we have a number of techniques to use for patients who have chronic pain. A neuromodulation is one of them. That's a broad category that covers things like spinal cord stimulators that can be implanted to help patients with chronic pain manage their pain without taking medications. Logical alternatives is what you're both suggesting here in this case to circumvent the opioid problem for an individual before it ever becomes one, it sounds like. Yes. And it's an individualized approach. It's not always a genomic approach, but it's an individualized approach. And that's really what here at Mayo Clinic we really try to do is, is take an individual approach to each patient as they come through. Uh, we have 60 seconds to go. Where does the future lead? What do we have to look forward to when it comes to pharmacogenomics? Well, I think that um, there are another, a number of ways that th this may be utilized. When I think about addiction, I think about identifying patients who may be at risk for addiction, identifying patients who may be better served by certain treatments for addiction, including medically assisted therapy, which is often a use of another opioid to treat uh, opioid addiction. Uh, and so I think that some of those applications may be very useful in the future. Dr. Curry, anything to add? I mean, I think it's a really exciting time, and it's a lot of unknowns at the moment. But as the science really progresses, I think we'll have the opportunity to learn and bring the researchers from all parts, both the addiction, from pain, and from, uh, from the pharmaco pharmacology aspect of it together to try to solve the problem. We've been talking about pharmacogenomics and pain medication with the director of the education program at the Center for Individualized Medicine, Dr. Timothy Curry, and assistant professor of anesthesiology and perioptive medicine, Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. <laughs> Dr. Helena Gazelka, thanks both of you for joining us. Thank you. Our pleasure.